Good morning, everyone. Not a, good morning, everyone. There we go. Good morning. My name is Roseanne Bump. I'm the executive at the River Falls Area Chamber of Commerce and Tourism Bureau. Welcome to our business breakfast this morning. It's great to see everyone here. Um, I realize that not all of you are done with your breakfast yet this morning. That's just fine. Go ahead and enjoy that. I've got some announcements, and it'll be a few minutes yet before we call the candidates up. The Chamber of Commerce is a nonprofit membership organization that's been serving the business community for over 50 years. We have about 300 members. Um, we also serve as the Tourism Bureau in town, so we're also the first point of contact for people coming in looking for information. Can everybody in the back of the room hear me okay? Yeah, I see heads nodding. And then we also do networking and educational events, and that's what a, a business breakfast is. So we do four or five of these a year on topics um, of interest to the business community. And our goal on these is to educate and inform our members so they know what that, what's happening on a regional basis. And I have to say this is a little bigger turnout than we typically get. We usually get uh, 60 to 90. I'm quite happy with the 300 people that we have here. So uh, welcome, everybody. It's great to see you. And for those that are regular attendees of our business breakfast, you'll find our format will be a little bit different this morning to allow um, more time for our topic this morning. I do want to take a moment to do some quick thank yous. First, thank you to everyone that's worked on making this happen, especially the committee that did the background work on this. Also, all of our volunteers that are here this morning, we appreciate that. Um, a special thank you, too, to the university. As you know, we changed venues uh, last minute last week so that we could have a bigger audience so that everybody could uh, participate if they chose. So thank you to the university for hosting us and, and taking care of all the details. We do appreciate that. Wanted to thank Blake Fry, who's right here. So I'm taking care of one more detail. Excuse me just a moment. <laughs> um, so he's with the chan chancellor's office and has been instrumental in making, making this happen. So we appreciate that. And of course, we couldn't have a forum without our candidates. So thank you both to our candidates for being here this morning. Um, one last housekeeping item. Should you need the restrooms, you can go out this back door and across the skyway, and they're on your left and your right. So, whatever you're comfortable. And then, as we do for all of our business breakfasts, we have a sponsor here this morning, Verizon Wireless World. Verizon World, Wireless World is a full-service Verizon store lake located on the north end of River Falls. They have all the latest gadgets and phones and plans to make your life easier and, if you're like me, more fun. I'd like to introduce Jeff Schwab to say a few words. Jeff. Well, thank you all for coming, and uh, I'm going to keep this real brief because I know in the interest of time, the reason why you're here um, for the candidates. Um, I just wanted to point out our facility is at the north end of town on the south end of shop, the Shopco parking lot. When uh, Roseanne asked me to host this, I never dreamed I'd have this many people to talk in front of. <laughs> so it's uh, uh, one of those windfalls. But uh, we have uh, all the different phones, all the different gadgets, and uh, we have a full staff that are ready to train you. We're open seven days a week, so come on out and see us. Thank you all for coming. And uh, one last thing, if you bring in the tent cards that are on the table, um, I'll give you $10 off your phone or accessories when you want to buy a phone or accessory with us. So if you're fighting over the tent cards, I have extra ones. So just come and see me afterwards. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Before I introduce our moderator, well, actually, and I'll, I'd like to invite our candidates up front if you'd like to come and get seated if Please. you're ready over there. And then before I introduce our moderator, I'd like to give a few highlights of the forum so that we all know what to expect this morning. The candidates will each begin with three minutes of opening comments. Our moderator will ask questions. These questions are based on questions that have been submitted to the chamber for consideration. We will alternate who answers first, so there was a coin toss earlier to see who begins. The first person to answer will have three minutes. The other candidates will have two minutes to respond to the same question. Um, you don't need to use all the time if you don't need that. I am playing timer, so I will attempt to give the candidates a 30-second warning before their time is up. Um, I also will take as many questions as we can before 8.40 a.m. There are some sheets of paper on your table, so if you'd like to submit a question, if you write that on there so that we can read it, put your name on there, raise it in the air, we'll have somebody come around and grab it. And then we'll end with two minutes wrap-up by each candidate. And then I want to be respectful of everyone's time this morning, so we will wrap up by 8.45 this morning. And of course, we expect our audience to be respectful at all times. We ask for no outbursts or distractions during the forum. 
Please remain seated so as not to block the view of the people behind you. So at this point, I'm going to introduce our moderator this morning, and then we'll, we'll get started on the forum. So our moderator this morning is Dr. Del Perman. Dr. Perman retired in 2002 after 19 years as senior minister of the First Congregational Church in River Falls. He is currently interim pastor of the Roberts United Church in Roberts, Wisconsin. He is a certified mediator in the Victim Offender Community Justice Program, serves on numerous board of directors, and has chaired many committees, including the public committee to plan and build the new city hall building here in River Falls. We appreciate his time this morning to moderate this forum. Dr. Perman. Thank you. Good morning to everybody, and thank you so much for being here. Thanks to the candidates for being here. Uh, we want to have this flow as easily as we can, and Roseanne made the point that uh, we uh, respect each one's uh, uh, opportunities, and we don't want to take advantage of the group. You all know, or some of you know, what my previous occupation was, and I'm not, uh, I don't take well to be told how much time I have, but that's all, <laughs> that's all right. I'll, I'll live with that. Uh, I, I did a little research and uh, uh, found out that easily you can say 374 words in two minutes. I don't know if you ever f tried that out, uh, figured that out. It would be a good discipline for you. Three, three minutes is approximately 561 words. and so. <laughs> We're going to try to limit it, uh, the uh, two uh, folks on the forum to uh, adhere to these times. I'm well aware, as uh, all of us are, that we have way more questions than we're going to have uh, the time to answer. And so both of the uh, folks have uh, acknowledged they would take whatever questions are left over and deal with them as they will. But we probably have only question, uh, time enough for uh, seven or eight questions, and um, so that's, that's how we'll deal with the rest. I don't think there's any other uh, uh, kinds of things that I need to, uh, to deal with, and so we'll get immediately to the uh, candidates. Uh, they will have a opening statement, uh, in a general statement, and we'll start with uh, uh, Ms. Moore. Okay. Well, first of all, good morning, and uh, I'd like to say thank you f to the River Falls Chamber of Commerce for organizing this event and the university for hosting. And uh, as I was saying this morning, the, the last time I was in this room, I was chaperoning prom. So I am aware of all the exits. And. <laughs> Um, but uh, my name is Shelley Moore. I am a third generation public school teacher from here in Wisconsin. And I, I come from a family of people who are dedicated in service specifically to this state. Um, I, veterans, firefighters, nurses, uh, farmers, teachers. Basically, um, my family roots have been, have, have been caught in those, those values that I believe that we hold dear as Wisconsinites. And they have instilled those values in me, um, protecting and supporting our, our senior citizens, respecting our local governments, uh, promoting a fair and transparent tax structure, and of course, most importantly, building a strong future for our children. These are the values that my family has instilled in me. And they have taught me that if you're not standing up for those values and standing up to defend the people who maybe don't have a voice for themselves or standing up for the people who haven't learned yet how to use that voice, like our children, um, then you're basically complying with, uh, with people who choose to hurt them. Wisconsin has been in a tumultuous time. And we've been struggling with how to deal with a lot of challenges facing our state. And it's about priorities and about values and about making sure that what we're doing is advancing our state in a way that holds dear to the values that we believe in and the reasons that we moved to this state or, or that we grew up with in this state. That quality of life for our citizenry, that's what we believe in. And that's what we need to make sure that we're promoting and protecting and not sacrificing. We need to make sure that we're being transparent with what we're doing, not just rushing things through, not listening to, to entities that are outside of our state and that would seek to hurt it. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
Well, I too would like to thank all of you for coming and for the River Falls Chamber for hosting this forum today, really allowing you to hear from us, the candidates, um, about our positions and views in this unprecedented recall election. Um, I myself um, grew up uh, in Lake Elmo, Minnesota. My family farmed there. When I was in, uh, going into ninth grade, we moved our farm operation to Western Wisconsin, Beldenville. And so I grew up in River Falls, graduated from River Falls High School, went on to get my four-year degree in animal science with a plan of always to farm. Um, after I got my four-year degree, I came back to farm. Also had the opportunity to work as an agricultural loan officer for about a year and a half. After about a year and a half, I decided to go back to my original goal of farming, and that's what I did for a number of years. During that time, my brother was in the state legislature, and it was when he decided not to run for re-election that he encouraged me to get more involved. One of the things my parents had always instilled in us was to take advantage of opportunities to make a difference when you could. And so I decided to run for the state assembly and was successful in that race, served in that um, in the assembly for 10 years, and then decided to go back to my original plan of farming. So I went back to the farm and, and then, of course, was encouraged to run for the state senate in 2000, where I've been there since. Um, you know, I never set out to be in public service, but I can tell you that um, I think it's so important that all of us, whether we run or whether we just are involved in issues, it's important to be a part of the political process. The budget that we dealt with when we began this session was a $3.6 billion budget shortfall. We set out to do exactly what you asked us to do, and that was get our fiscal house in order, make the tough decisions. Unlike other states who have looked at um, basically laying off thousands of, of workers, we wanted to avoid those massive layoffs. So we made the tough decisions. And what you are seeing now is what happens when you stand up to the big spending, powerful special interests. I'm going to try out this mic and come up here. I feel there's a great gulf between us here. So <laughs> since uh, Ms. Moore gets the first question, I'm coming here so you can both hear it well. Democrats have been critical of policies Governor Walker has credited for attracting private sector jobs to Wisconsin. Please explain legislation you would propose to attract businesses to Wisconsin and create new jobs in western Wisconsin. Thank you very much, Dell. The Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation that Governor Walker started in this budget has the plan or the theory that it will set out to create jobs. It's been given a slush fund of a significant amount of money without checks. But where this program comes from is actually a group called the Wisconsin Economic Development Association, which did a study in the state of Wisconsin and studied businesses and produced a document last August called the Be Bold Wisconsin document. Be Bold Wisconsin actually has nine different proposals for ways to promote business in Wisconsin. Number one, promoting a skilled workforce. That document helps the significance of our, our Wisconsin technical colleges and our fine university system, like the, one we're, the university we're at right now. It talks about the need to promote strong uh, pre-K-12 programs as well. And so if the, no, the number one thing that this proposal found is that we need to make sure that we have a skilled workforce, the strong work ethic that's dedicated and loyal to the businesses, and then we will continue to grow. We need to make sure that we're looking at innovative jobs, like Wisconsin always has, not continuing to rely on traditional manufacturing jobs that, first of all, do not really exist in western Wisconsin, since the preponderance of those jobs, actually 50 percent, are located between Milwaukee and Madison. We need to make sure that we're growing our rural communities by building on those innovations. And we have seen in Wisconsin a significant increase in venture capitalism, actually since 2003, almost a 20-fold increase in funds coming into Wisconsin to support growth of those businesses. The answer is looking at the Be Bold Wisconsin document, taking into consideration the proposals presented by the Wisconsin Economic Development Association, and making sure that we are putting our money where the businesses say it belongs. That is supporting a skilled workforce first and making sure that we're promoting the future of Wisconsin, not just temporary solutions, by creating long-term, innovative, game-changing jobs that are family-sustaining, not temporary, seasonal, minimum wage employment. 
Therefore, what I would support is, of course, programs that do, in fact, promote those things, examining the Be Bold Wisconsin document. And a secondary point on this is this. Anytime we talk about investing money in corporations, in businesses, and any other entities, we have to make sure that we are being fiscally responsible and illustrating fiscal integrity with our tax dollars. That means making sure that there are checks on those dollars. Unfortunately, when proposals were put in place to check to make sure that uh, the money was being used in a frugal, responsible way and that reports were issued documenting job creation, unfortunately, my opponent chose to strike those checks from the budget. It is critical that we illustrate fiscal integrity with taxpayer dollars when we talk about job creation, and it is critical that we make sure that those jobs are family sustaining and that they support our small rural communities and we continue to support Western Wisconsin. Thank you. Well, we are not studying. We are actually doing. And I'm pleased to say in this, the first thing that this legislature did in recognizing the importance of balancing the budget, getting our fiscal house in order, and actually putting people back to work, we went into a special session on job creation. So we passed legislation dealing with tax incentives. Those dollars, those dollars will not be spent unless jobs are actually created in our state. So, and we also dealt with regulatory reform. That means we need to create an environment in our state where we have a friendly climate for job creators. That's what turns our economy around, and that's what we have to create. And I'm pleased to say that was a top priority. It's the first issues that we dealt with in this legislative session. We created a new economic, Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation. The previous Department of Commerce, 19% of their effort focused on job creation. I'm pleased to say that the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation, that new entity, 100% of their focus is going to be on creating jobs and creating an environment that's positive for job creators in our state. And you know what? We're already seeing the benefits of this. Wisconsin, since the first of the year, has already seen over 39,000 new jobs being created. In the last month alone, 12,900 new private sector jobs were created. Half of the jobs new jobs created in the country were created in our state. The reforms that we've passed are working. We need to continue on this, the, the path of talking to businesses. You know, it was um, not too long ago I invited the new president of the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation to our region, to the Senate District, to visit with businesses, to hear from them, to hear from those of you in this room who are business owners. You need to hear, tell us what is important to you, to allow you to expand your business, what we need to do to make sure you want to stay in this state. You know, all we need to do is look at what Wisconsin, uh, Minnesota and Illinois is doing. They are chasing jobs out of their state by creating an unfriendly tax climate. We rotate uh, then uh, uh, the major questions, and so this is for Senator Harsdorf. Aside from jobs, uh, job growth, what are the most important factors to create a healthy business climate in Senate District 10? And, and you may have already touched on some of those. Yeah, um, in addition to the tax climate, I would say that it's also the regulatory reform. You know, we've heard examples. I remember um, a few years ago, I, I had a business come in and they said, you know, we really want to come to Wisconsin. But you know what? You know, it just takes so much time to get permits. Not necessarily that you get a positive response, but you need a timely response. And we need to make sure that our agencies, that, that businesses need to go through you know, for water quality permits, for whatever permits that they need, that it's done in a timely fashion. But this particular business came in and said, you know what, we came into Wisconsin, we've been in other states, we're looking at another state, and they said it'll take like maybe two or three months to get through the permitting process. Wisconsin. We've had a track record of six months, 12 months, in some cases two and three years. That is unacceptable. So obviously in addition to the tax climate, we have to look at timeliness, responsiveness from our state agencies. And as I said earlier in the previous question, we need a Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation. We need an entity that focuses 100% on creating jobs and working with businesses to make that happen. Okay. Um, since we both addressed the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation, um, the biggest difference I think that I can illustrate between us is that my opponent thinks it's acceptable to have them not have any checks and to just give them carte blanche with taxpayer dollars. 
and, and I don't think that is acceptable. Um, the things that businesses uh, in the study, in the Be Bold Wisconsin study, the things that businesses indicated, again, first and foremost, was making sure that we had a skilled workforce, which I happen to think it is a priority to educate our children and provide opportunities for their future. The second thing, they also indicated the regulations. They also indicated the tax structure, not the amount in taxes, but the way that taxes were figured, the complications with the tax structure, and trying to simplify that. And that actually, that has not happened. In fact, we've created more challenges to the tax structure with more confusing this incentive or that incentive or whatever it, or whatever it may be in that cycle. We need to make sure that we're actually simplifying things so that businesses can grow here and so that we're able to start and create those businesses, but they do not come here unless we have a skilled workforce and unless we have that in place. The senator mentioned job creation, and she used some numbers that sound impressive. And the numbers come from the McIver Institute, which is, of course, a group that is, it uses some questionable mathematics from time to time. The fact of the matter is you can't just subtract the number of jobs created in the nation or subtract the jobs created here in Wisconsin from the jobs created in the nation and conclude that 50 percent of all jobs were created in Wisconsin. I think we can all see that that is, that is a leap of logic from 50 states in the union. More importantly, though, she's admitted in those, in those studies, the number of jobs that have actually been lost, the number of layoffs, um, a lot of significant layoffs, of course, in our public sector as a result of the cuts that came down after the budget, and has omitted those. And also, we need to talk about the type of jobs that we're creating. It's not enough just to, create, to, to open a business. We need to make sure that we're creating jobs that stay here and that are family sustaining. Thank you. This uh, question is for Ms. Moore. Governor Walker recently signed a budget passed by the Republican-controlled state legislature that balanced the state budget. What primary steps would you have taken to balance the state budget? Excellent. Thank you. Balancing a budget, and we all know this from balancing our personal budgets, is about establishing priorities. You've got two things that happen. You've got what you're spending and you've got what you're taking in, and you need to create a balance between those two things. Unfortunately, if you excuse me, if you ask somebody what they pay taxes for, what they're going to say to you is they believe they pay taxes to support schools, to support their local communities, to have protection from police and fire. They'll tell you that they believe that they're, some people will say they believe they're supporting uh, uh, welfare programs and assistance. Every single one of the programs I just mentioned to you took a significant cut in this budget. But none of you are getting rebate checks. In fact, your taxes are slated to go up, according to the Le Independent Legislative Fiscal Bureau, and possibly go up even more than was predicted. So where is that money going? And what checks do we have on those taxpayer dollars? The bottom line is this. We should have a transparent government. We should have a government that tells you exactly what they're doing with your tax dollars. And you should know that. That's the first and foremost thing you should do. When you shift money from the recycling program to go to the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation without any requirement that they even follow open meetings or open records laws, that's not right. We need to make sure that we know exactly what is happening. I don't think people fully comprehend the number of services and programs that they're going to see cut or reduced as a result of this budget. And I think in six months from now, people are going to say, but I've always been able to go there at that time and get that service. Or, or I've always been able to get this permit then, or when can I go to the Department of Motor Vehicles? When will they be open? And we're not going to know until six months from now the full impact of this. And yet we don't know exactly where all of that money is going. What the senator and her friends passed is the most significant or most expensive budget Wisconsin has ever seen. It actually increases costs. It actually is a billion dollars more in costs than previous budgets. So now where is that money going? And I think we know the answer. It's going unchecked to some, some corporations for programs that we don't know whether or not they'll be successful. And that's just not acceptable. So in answer to the question of how would I have balanced this budget, I would have looked at two things, not just at our spending, but I would have established priorities within that spending that clearly made sure we were supporting the future of Wisconsin. And I would have looked at the revenue side as well. What loopholes do we need to make sure we're closing to make sure that we have a transparent tax structure in Wisconsin that's easier for people to understand so they fully comprehend where their money is going and what it's being spent on? Thank you. 
Well, the question is um, what my opponent um, would suggest in balancing the budget. It's easy to be critical, but uh, being a leader is about solutions. And there's three options that you, that you have when you look at a budget shortfall. You can either raise taxes, cut spending, or increase debt. I will tell you that I stood up for taxpayers and I was not willing to support a tax increase. I don't believe that that is the answer to getting and growing our economy. You don't tax your way into prosperity. We don't want to borrow and bury our kids and our grandkids in debt. That is not the option. Um, so we were left with cutting spending. These were tough choices. But I believe that these are the essential choices that we have to be willing to make. We have to create a state government, a government that lives within the means of our taxpayers. My opponent, um, don't be fooled. When you talk about loopholes in, in taxes, that's a tax increase, pure and simple. Um, my, my opponent claims that she doesn't, um, that she doesn't, I'm not sure if she's, I think she's saying she's not going to want to raise taxes. But the bottom line is talking about eliminating loopholes will affect and it will increase your taxes. Uh, the choices are not easy, but the bottom line is we've got to live within the means of the taxpayers. We've got to make the tough choices. And we are seeing in a state that is willing to do that, which we have, we are seeing the reforms working. We, the reforms, the flexibilities that we've given local governments and schools, we are beginning now to hear the savings that they are, that they are experiencing, that they are seeing. These are savings of your tax dollars. This is a time that we all have to work together to make government work more efficiently, effectively, and again, within the means of the taxpayers. Another question uh, along the lines of the, the budget and such. Uh, this is for you, Senator Harsdorf. According to the Milwaukee uh, Journal Sentinel, Wisconsin relies more on income and property tax for its revenue than most states. Both are approximately 25% higher than the national average. Can this tax burden be relieved while still providing services the residents of Wisconsin have come to rely upon? Well, I think, I think what that points out is that we are a high tax state. And for those who say, you know, we can't solve a budget shortfall without raising taxes, all we need to do is look at the high taxing states like Illinois, like Minnesota. And Wisconsin is one of them. But right now, we are taking a different path than our neighbors to the west and to the south. We are taking a path of recognizing we have to make the tough cuts. We have to make the tough choices. And, and it is about getting our, spend, our, our taxes in line with what, what taxpayers can, can afford. But you don't do that by continuing to have out of control spending. My opponent is, has supported um, the failed policies of the past administration. You know, you look at the special interests that have, that have driven this recall effort that are driving us trying to go back to failed policies. Let's look at the last state budget bill, a budget bill that raised taxes by over $4 billion. $4 billion of taxes that affected every one of you in this room. There was a phone tax increase. There was an increase in the sick tax. There was an increase in the nursing home tax on seniors. The bottom line is, we have got to recognize that the failed policies of the past, that let previous, previous budget that raised taxes by over $4 million, we lost jobs, 190,000 jobs. My opponent in the previous question talked about, you know, I admitted, I admitted that, that we lost jobs. We did in the last budget when we had $4 billion worth of tax increases. Those are job-killing taxes, job-killing taxes that my opponent has written to me urging me to support. That is not the direction I want to go. And I think all we need to do is look at our neighboring states, the different path that they're taking, and the jobs that they are losing while Wisconsin is gaining. Um, it's, it's difficult sometimes to follow um, what the senator says. She says that uh, she had to make tough choices and cut spending, yet the budget passed is the most expensive budget in history. She says that she is not in favor of raising taxes and that changing loopholes would in fact be a raise in taxes. In addition to the fact that changing loopholes would be a, a change in her tax structure, what do you say then, Senator, to the 247,000 people who currently receive the Homestead Credit? 
that you voted to cut. That is a tax increase to those persons who will now struggle, those seniors who will now struggle to stay in their homes. And what do you say to the working poor who currently receive an earned income tax credit? And they, earn, they receive this because they're working, but yet it's not enough for them to be able to sustain their family. You voted to cut that too. That's a tax increase to those people. There's a lot of numbers, a lot of jargon, a lot of things thrown around. The bottom line is simple. We know that our taxes are high for some of Wisconsin. I read that study that was in the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. It said that Wisconsin ranks fourth in taxes based on ability to pay based on personal income. That means what they examined was the people of Wisconsin. They looked at our ability to pay based on the taxes that we were being charged, okay? And determined that the middle class in Wisconsin pays a disproportionate rate of taxes. And then the reason for that is, is the way that some of our taxes are devised. One of the biggest things is large industry, especially in southeast Wisconsin, special, especially in the Milwaukee area, that pays almost the lowest property taxes for industry land in the United States. They are 48th. It's a disparity. My opponent wants the middle class to pay for it. I believe in shared sacrifice. Thank you. It's okay for everybody to take a deep breath. So, <laughs> this uh, question is for Ms. Moore. Mm -hmm. Affordable health insurance is becoming harder to find for individuals and small businesses. What can be done on the state level to ensure access to affordable, quality coverage? That's a wonderful question. Um, one of my one of my favorite attack ads by one of the the many uh, large moneyed outside groups that's supporting my opponent, um, which shows a bunch of horrible pictures of me, says at the end that uh, I'm supporting uh, for lavish union benefits. I want everybody every worker to pay five hundred and ten dollars a month for their health care. I don't know about the rest of you, but I I got up my paycheck stub and added up how much I actually pay a month for health care. And I pay about $510 a month currently, and will pay a significant amount more than that next year at my, at my job. And that's, that's what we pay now for health care. And I think it just illustrates just how out of touch she is with how much we are currently paying for basic health care. How much most of us are paying for out-of-pocket costs. How many of us have been switched to high-end deductible plans where you actually sit and weigh whether or not it's better for you to go get medicine you know will help you versus sitting and saving that in case you're going to need it later. How many of us are making those decisions right now? I know I sat there and looked at the cuts in pay that I'd accepted to help out my state and said, is it worth it for me to pay for health care? I'm a relatively healthy young woman. But we don't know what's going to happen. And we shouldn't have people making those tough, having to make those tough choices. The answer is simple. There's a lot, lot of ways that we can make sure that health care is affordable. And in fact, we have had a system that worked so well that it was highly respected and highly regarded by all the other states in the nation, and that's Badger Care. My opponent, however, wishes to roll back on our support for Badger Care. Badger Care is a program that our farmers, our small business owners, have been able to use. I've talked to several small business owners here in River Falls who use Badger Care as their health care because it's, it's the only health care that they can afford, and it works for them. It's helped them be able to have families, and I think that's what we need to make sure that we're doing. We can do this. It is far cheaper for us to make sure that we are providing health care than it is for us to fix, to help somebody once they've reached a, a, critical, a, a critical time with an illness. We need to make sure that we're protecting people now, and it can be done. We need to get our health care costs in check. This isn't about health insurance. It is about health care care, the cost of care, and we do need to make sure that we're examining that and getting that in check. But at the time, rolling back on support for fundamental services for people who utilize Badger Care, who utilize family care so that they're able to, to stay in their own homes, who utilize senior care, that's wrong. These programs work. They've been proven to be economically responsible and to save our state money in the long run. That's what we need to make sure that we're doing is and supporting and continuing to examine those services and those possibilities. Because the truth is, most of us are already paying a lot more than we probably can afford for basic health care. Affordable health care is one of the big challenges. Um, this is an issue that is dealt with both at the state level and at the federal level. 
Um, affordable health care is important. And one of the things that Wisconsin is, is um, ranked relatively high on about the fourth state is the number of uninsured. The more uninsured the state has, the more costs that are shifted to those that are paying. And so we need to work to reduce the number of uninsured in the state. But one of the things, I've supported a number of things. Number one, I've supported, I was in the legislature and, and supported when we created Badger Care, and I've continued to support Badger Care, a low income program for offering health insurance to the low income. Um, I've supported, in fact, I worked to keep senior care. I was there to create it, and, and in this budget, I'm pleased to say we were able to, to retain senior care, an important drug program, a legal drug program, by the way, for seniors. Um, you know, we also, one of the first things in our special session on job creation was we passed legislation allowing for a tax deduction for those who are using health savings accounts. Health savings accounts are critical, they're very beneficial to our job providers and are self-employed. And Wisconsin was one of a couple of states that did not allow at the state level that tax deduction for those utilizing health savings accounts. I'm pleased we were finally, after we passed it in the pre, under the previous administration and, and the previous gov Governor Doyle had continued to, to veto that bill, we finally got that signed into law this session. But let me say, um, you know, this is about um, working to policies that really work. And when we talk about affordable health care, an issue that, that affects every one of us in this room and it affects seniors. Um, I would really take issue with my opponent who continues to, to scare and to mislead and lie to seniors about, about a position that, that I'm supposed to have on a federal issue. Continue, even after she was um, by the state's largest newspaper declared to be called liar, liar, pants on fire, she continues to send out flyers lying and, and, and to our seniors and that is not right. This question is for Senator Harsdorf. You have stated changes to collective bargaining rights for public employees are a necessary tool for local government working to balance their budgets. Would you support limited collective bargaining rights for public employees whose collective bargaining rights were not addressed in the budget repair bill? Well, we, we actually um, maintain collective bargaining on wages for public employees in the budget. And one of the things that um, it's important to recognize, many have questioned, well, why did we do that? Um, there's no cost. Uh, in fact, my opponent has said there's no cost to collective bargaining. The reality is there is a cost. And we, we can see examples that have been cited by those units of government that are affected. The fact is we've he heard the example of, of the, the individual, the senior, who volunteered to serve as a crossing guard in his local community, was two blocks from his house, loved getting up and going and volunteering. The union came in and said, you know, if you want a crossing guard there, you need to pay for somebody to do that. Or the community that had the county inmates mow the medians. And the union came in and said, no, if you want someone to mow that, that, that grass, you need to hire somebody to have somebody to do that. And then, of course, there's the example in the Milwaukee public school system where, where, the, where the union members negotiated to have access to Viagra. It cost the school district and the taxpayers over $800,000. So the reality is there is a cost. And one of the things that we need to do is look at giving tools and flexibility to our local units of government so that they can manage their budgets. This is about protecting taxpayers and it's about providing the best education system we can to our kids. Right now our school district's hands are tied. I'm hearing from school superintendents. They know that these reforms are going to provide opportunities for them to make sure that they are creating the best education possible. And it's also going to enable them to reward the best teachers. That is what these reforms are about. We are seeing them working. We are hearing school districts talking about the savings that they are experiencing by being able to competitively bid for health insurance. You know, what we ask for in this budget you know, I, I'm not sure the $500 figure that my opponent's talking about, she's paying for health insurance. But what we are asking public employees to do is pay 12% of their health insurance. 12%. Now, I don't know how many of you who are in this room who are self-employed who are paying 12% or less for their health insurance. I haven't heard from any. A farmer I know is telling me he pays $1,300 a month for his health insurance. And guess what? It's a $5,000 deductible. 
So these reforms are about giving tools to local governments and schools to allow us to manage the t this tough economy. This is a tough economy. But what Wisconsin is doing is we are putting in place these reforms that are actually avoiding mass layoffs, unlike what we're seeing in other states. We are not avoiding mass layoffs. So we might as well get past that to begin with. When a school district lays off every single member of its, fa of its faculty and then recalls some, we're not avoiding mass layoffs. We all know people who are public workers, public school teachers, county workers, who have seen either layoffs or cuts in pay. Collective bargaining has been in Wisconsin since 1959 a way for people to sit down and talk with each other. It's been about compromise and it's been about shared sacrifice. When we talk about the ludicrous examples that my opponent uses, such as the Viagra thing, actually that case was about a breach of contract and was about a complete prescription drug program that was totally paid for by givebacks and compensation in the salary of the employees of the Milwaukee Public Schools, not by taxpayers. It was completely givebacks and insurance. And incidentally, the employees of the Milwaukee Public Schools are also taxpayers. The way collective bargaining works is people sit down together. They have a whole bunch of things that they want to talk about. And in most cases, especially when we talk about public workers and public school teachers, we're not talking about salary. We are talking about working conditions. We're talking about the ability to decide what is taught in the classroom. We're talking about prep time. We're talking about safety concerns on the work site for our road crews. That's what we're talking about when we talk about collective bargaining. But I'm not surprised that my opponent doesn't understand all of the ramifications of collective bargaining. Because at the end of the day, what collective bargaining is about is two people, or two groups of people, sitting down, respecting each other, drawing conclusions together with thoughtfulness, respect, listening, and compromise. These are all things that have been completely lost in the current Wisconsin legislature. Uh, this question is for Ms. Moore. Many are expressing increased frustration with the inability to elect officials to reach bipartisan agreements at all levels of government. What will you do to bring about compromise in Madison? Thank you very much. Um, well, I, for 13 years I've gotten high school boys to work together and dance in a musical, so <laughs> thinking <laughs> If I could get them boys to dance. Um, here's the thing. I've always believed, um, I've always believed in, in voting your conscience and in being independent. I've worked very hard on that. Uh, within, within my involvement in the Teachers Association, I actually helped organize a Republican Educators Leadership Conference, which I've been able to, to attend over the years, because I believe so strongly that when we talk about public education, it should be nonpartisan, and everybody should be supporting our students. And I've worked hard to do that. I, I've actually apparently done it enough. I actually I made the senator's volunteer recall list. I got a phone call from your staff about volunteering for your campaign. I'm going to decline, but thanks for the call. Um, but I think that illustrates that obviously I, I made the list because I've worked very hard to do that. I have, I've been appointed to a commission in, in uh, Washington, D.C., whose job it was was to challenge the status quo in education because that's always the way I thought. It's always about doing what we can do better, not with more but what we can do better. And that's what I've always believed. And that means sitting down together and utilizing the skills and strengths that all of us provide and saying, what can we do? Um, and, and I believe very strongly uh, that that is what we need to do. It's, um, it's strange. Not, I mean, I'm new to this, as you know. I'm, I'm not a politician. I, I, I enjoy the study of it. I, have a degree that I don't use very often in political science with an emphasis in constitutional law. It's getting to run for its money right now. But, uh, but what I have noticed in sitting with a, a someone who's been in office for nearly a quarter of a century is I, I do think that people start to lose touch with the people that they represent and that it's really important that you maintain that focus and that you remember to go talk to the homes of, of the people, of the citizens. and they. It's easy to say that you, you're blaming outside special interests or whatever else, and maybe that helps you sleep at night and helps you not think about Lori, the single mother in Star Prairie who's lost her job at the technical college with all of these cuts, 
and who now probably can't afford to pay her tuition for herself and, and her son. Or my friend Tammy, who's looking at maybe having to be institutionalized, who, let me tell you, she doesn't belong in an institution. Or maybe it helps you not think about Margaret. She's 75, she's a spitfire, I tell you. Um, and Margaret is concerned about what she's going to be able to do and whether she's going to be able to stay in her home after her husband Lowell passed away two years ago and what she can afford. She lives in Roberts. And I think about these people and all of the wonderful people I've had the opportunity to meet across the Senate District over the past few months. And I say, you know what? That's what we're here for. That's why we need to be able to compromise. I have a long history of working together in the legislature. Compromise is important. Um, working on issues like the Stillwater Bridge is essential to our area. Working to reinstate reciprocity that should never have been lost under, under the last administration. And I will continue to work together from people on both sides of the aisle. That is how you get done, things done. But in this budget, I'm sorry, my opponents plan for compromise will compromise our kids' future. It will compromise balancing our state budget. And it will compromise the opportunities for taxpayers to prosper in the state. OK. This question is for Senator Harsdorf. Uh, it is challenging for school districts to develop long-term strategic plans when state funding levels are unpredictable. What options exist to provide a more even study revenue stream to schools? Well, that's a great question. It's probably one of the biggest challenges that the legislature has struggled with over, over time is how to fund schools. I was actually in the legislature when we, in the mid-90s, when we had a major overhaul in how we funded schools, shifting it off the property tax in order to provide property tax relief and shifting it on to more of the state taxpayers when we made the two-thirds commitment to schools. And that, that commitment, um, that commitment um, was in place um, for many years. That was a top priority. Education has always been, it is, the largest, single largest line item appropriation in the budget. And it needs to continue. That's where it should be. Um, the legislature's top priority was maintaining that two-thirds commitment. And it was easy to do when we had surplus revenues in the 90s. But as we got into budget shortfalls, and we had to make, um, we continued to maintain that two-thirds commitment, even when we had budget shortfalls while we cut spending elsewhere because we recognized the importance of that priority. However, it was under the last administration when, um, as budget shortfalls continued, that finally a, a, a cut to education did, did occur. Um, this budget, la last budget, um, school aides were cut about $660 million by the Doyle administration. And what he did is he allowed that increase to be shifted onto the property tax. So while it didn't affect the schools, it affected U.S. property taxpayers. In this budget, we wanted to recognize the need to, to cut, spe cut spending and balance the budget, but we did not want to shift that onto the property tax freeze, uh, property taxpayers. So we enacted a very strict property tax freeze to ensure that that did not happen. And for the schools to deal with those reductions, that's what these tools, these, that's what these flexibilities are all about. Because without these reforms, and let me tell you, the delay in passing or in enacting the budget reform, repair bill, we heard from schools. I met with schools. They were fearful. They were so concerned. How long were these reforms going to be blocked by the special interests? Because without these reforms, they would be in a world of hurt, and it would really be disastrous to our kids. And so I'm pleased that we were finally able to enact the budget repair bill, which is intended to give them the flexibilities that they need to deal with these cuts. School funding is, of course, a significant issue. In 1993, when my opponent was serving in the assembly, the way that they chose to deal with, with school funding was to institute basically arbitrary caps that were supposed to sunset. They did not. 
and we're supposed to go back and revisit the school funding system. They did not. There have been numerous studies of ways to better fund schools in Wisconsin, um, some done by, uh, a, a, by a variety of groups, basically. Uh, some suggest that what we really need to do is examine, of course, the way our schools are funded because the property tax model is ineffective in the fact that it disproportionately negatively affects school districts that live in places that do not have a high, that, or that have either a lot of state and national land or places where the property values exceed the value of the, or the uh, income of the average person living in that community. School funding is very, very complicated. The bottom line is this. The Wisconsin Association of School District Administrators, the Wisconsin Association of School Boards, as well as the various teachers associations and associations affecting other employees within school districts, all came out and said, wait a second. You think you're giving us tools. You're not giving us tools to improve education. You're giving us tools to cut employees. We don't need to cut employees. We need to make sure we're providing for the future of our schools. I know in my particular school district that has seen cut after cut after cut. And the reason is because of arbitrary caps pay, placed on a fiscally responsible school district in a place where because of the way the land is, the preponderance of the land, they're not getting the income that they should be getting. We need to make sure that what we're doing is going back and revisiting that. Real leadership would have instituted a school funding model that worked and that helped here. The real question is this. If our schools are suffering, if our schools need tools, why now at a time when we need to provide for the future, why then would, would my opponent vote to shift funding to the Milwaukee Private School Voucher Program? This uh, question is for uh, uh, Ms. Moore. Mm -hmm. Uh, you have been portrayed as a candidate primarily interested in protecting the rights of unions. What is your response to this? It's, this is one thing uh, that's been interesting to me is how, how someone is portrayed. Um, I know who I am. And it's been the one thing that's kept me going through this entire, the constant negative attacks. And I know that, um, that my opponent's anti-me website with all of its, its jargon and propaganda that there's only one true fact actually on there. I know the truth of why I decided to step forward and do this. You know, the thing is, on August 10th, if I wake up and my name doesn't have the most votes, I have a contract with the Elser School District, working with students that I love, in a school district that I love, with a faculty that I love. But I know that this is about more than me. April 1st was a Friday. That particular day, there were questions about tuition reciprocity. I teach 27 advanced placement literature students in my first period class, juniors and seniors planning for college. Before school, the kids were huddled in the room, some doing some last minute studying for a final exam, some not so much. And I was working with one child on a, that we're sitting in the back of the room before class, working with him on one-on-one -on -one with some of his essays. There's a student who sits back by my desk who is not so much of a studier. He's a C student with an A brain. And uh, he said, they're taught, the students are just talking amongst themselves. And he said, you know what? I'm not going to bother coming back to Wisconsin after I graduate because there won't be anything left here for me. I had been asked to consider running for this seat. And I had respectfully declined until I heard those words. I love this state. I love Wisconsin. I love being here, I love Senate District 10, I love this area. It's where my ancestors on my father's side settled when they came here from Norway. It's where the old farms were here and my, my great grandpa was chairman of the St. Croix County Board of Supervisors and ran the toll bridge. He was appointed postmaster by William McKinley. We've been here a long time and I'm not about to let everything that I love about the state go out the window that quickly. There's too much to love and respect and admire about Wisconsin to watch us continue to be a joke on Jay Leno. I know why I'm here. It's why I've done just about everything I've done in my life, because of my love of the state and my love of those kids in my classroom and my hope for the future. Thank you. My opponent um, has been very active. In, in fact, she's on, served on the state committee for the 
state's teachers union, I think on the state board. She's involved in the national teachers union. And when the protests started in Madison earlier this year, following the introduction of the budget repair bill, she attended the rallies in Madison, the protests with tens of thousands of people, but she didn't just attend. She was a featured speaker at these rallies. She was firing up the people. You know, I am not misrepresenting my opponent. You know, if you go to moretaxes.com, those are her words, not mine. Go take a look. She was in Madison talking about we breathe unions, declaring war. And then she came back to school and used the school emails. Yeah, the size. You know, that's not okay. It's not legal. And it has nothing to do with declaring as a candidate, as she has said in previous, a previous form. No government employee can use their taxpayer-funded computer for partisan political purposes, and it has nothing to do with being declared a candidate. And then she disregarded. She basically dismissed that she didn't care if it was against the laws. That is wrong. If you have an elected official with power that doesn't care if she's complying with the laws, Boy, I tell you, that's a dangerous situation. But I don't know what's worse. I don't know what's worse than having an elected official who doesn't care about the laws and the rules or someone who's teaching our kids that it doesn't matter. It's okay. Okay. Uh, the last question you will answer, you will respond, and then you will have the closing statement for two minutes and then you'll have a closing statement for two minutes so so we all understand what the procedure is uh, this question the state budget uh, you played a key role in crafting has been labeled as benefiting large corporations over the interests of this region what is your response to this well this is a this is a time, there's two things that Wisconsin needs to do to turn our economy around. Number one, get our fiscal house in order. And that was what the budget did in balancing and cutting the spending, getting the spending in line with what taxpayers can afford, making the tough, tough choices. But it's also about growing jobs. And that's the other thing that, that we focused on, not only in the special session initially, but also in the budget, rep budget bill. We wanted to create an environment. We wanted to create incentives for businesses to come here. We wanted to create incentives not only for businesses to come here from Minnesota and Illinois, Illinois that is plummeted in where they rank in being friendly to businesses. Those businesses, I've already heard that some of them are looking at, they're talking to our state about what they can do to relocate to, to Wisconsin. But that's what it's about. It's about creating incentives. And not only for those businesses from out of state, but we also need to look at what we can do to keep the businesses that we have here and encourage them to expand. You know, I've talked to businesses, I've traveled this district and asked them, what do we need to do? How are you doing? There's some that are doing okay. There's some that want to expand, but they want to know that they're not going to be taxed out of the state. They want to know that they're not going to be regulated out of the state. They want some affirmation that we recognize and we want them to be here. We can't turn our economy around without the job creators in our state. And that's what I will continue to work for, to create that environment where businesses want to stay here, They're, they know that they can count on us to provide them a positive, friendly business climate. Thank you. What makes a business come somewhere? We've discussed several times. What makes a business grow? We haven't discussed. What makes a business grow is demand. You have demand when people purchase your goods and your services. When you have cut the salaries and the ability to buy goods and services of a large number of people, you have less demand. I would like to quote my opponent's good friend, Isaac Wicks. Mr. Wicks said in a forum once that, uh, that corporations don't pay taxes, they just shift that money into increasing costs onto the people that buy their goods and services. 
If corporations don't pay taxes, why do they need tax breaks and tax incentives? The answer is simple. It's about paying money to good friends. That's all we've seen. My opponent wishing to give money to her friends and saying that it's about growing jobs. It doesn't grow jobs. It's a simple history lesson that, just, that, that all of us know. There were still people producing things in 1929. There was just no one able to buy them. It doesn't do you any good to have businesses if you don't have people to buy those goods and services. I know I've had to look at my, as, as we agreed through shared sacrifice to do whatever we could to help the state and help the school district that I love. And I agreed to a, a pay cut of $500 a month. And then I sat down and said, what does this mean I can't do in my budget? Well, I buy Steve's pizza about once a week. I'm a little addicted. Um, good local business. I probably can't do that as much anymore. It's little things like that that will affect that business and will affect that business's ability to hire new people and so on and so forth. We need family sustaining jobs that continue to grow our economy. That's what we need. We need money in the hands of the people. Thank you. We're uh, to the point now where we're going to ask the uh, uh, two respondents to give a two minute summation and uh, after which there's a few announcements uh, by the chamber and then we will uh, dismiss for today. But I, I really want to thank you all for coming and thank you all for being a part of this process. It's a significant process and, and you've behaved yourself admirably. I'm, uh, I'm impressed. So. I wish my Sunday morning crowd would be this. Uh, <laughs> Patty is back there. She knows what I'm talking about. So would you begin, please? Of course. I guess I had no idea the extent to which my opponent was unwilling to face the reality of the situation that we're in. The 23,000 signatures that were signed, casting continuous aspersions, saying things that aren't true. We've discussed and dealt with the reality of the emails. We've discussed and dealt with the reality of edited statements taken out of context. I do say that there is a war on the middle class, and I think we continue to see that to be true. The truth is quite simple. We need to make sure that we're continuing to grow Wisconsin. My opponent wants to confuse people and mislead them by talking about things that are not relevant and things that are frankly not true. And on one hand, she says that she wants to make sure that, that we don't have too much power in the hands of the administration by working on the Frankenstein veto. And on the other hand, she goes and gives this governor unprecedented power with complete control over administrative rules, taking over the DNR our veterans affairs associations against the, the protests of our veterans groups and our environmental groups and our, hunts, our hunters and sportsmen. She says she's for the middle class, yet we continue to see tax increases, and yes they are tax increases, on our hardest working people. She says she's for schools, and actually in this, in this particular debate actually said that the things they did don't affect schools and that if we, we want to have the best education systems. Well, it probably would have been more honest for me to take the $6,000 pay cut I and my colleagues in Ellsworth High School accepted, accepted uh, for next year and just write that check over to my opponent's friends at M&I Bank, because at least that would have been more transparent. What we need to do... Now there'll is be, not the time. Oops, sorry. There'll be a time to applaud in just a little sorry. bit. So. Real quickly. Would you have your let me finish. Let me finish. Oh, I'm sorry. Now I, is now is not the time for these extremist partisan activities. Now is the time for civility, and it's what I've stood for, and it's what I believe in above all else. It's because of those kids. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you again all for coming, and I know this has been a, you know. Probably most of you are either with me or with my opponent. But I appreciate that, you, you're, that you're here listening because it really is. Government is about not always agreeing, but it's about being able to be civil and respectful and re respecting other views. And, um, 
And I believe that is so very important. And I know that there have been many things that have been going on over the last few months where that has not been seen. And I hope that um, we will all make an effort to, to as we move down uh, this road, get back to being able to disagree and still be civil, respectful, and sometimes even friends. Um, but this budget, this budget is about priorities. And it is about getting our fiscal house in order. It is about standing up for taxpayers. We made the tough choices. We stood up the, to the special interests that you are seeing heavily dominated in advertising in this race. They're spending millions in this race. And, um, but that's what we're elected to do, to, do, to do. We're elected to make the tough choices. And I'm not going to back down. I'm not going to be intimidated. Because there's too much at stake. There's too much at stake to making sure that I want to move Wisconsin in the right direction. I want opportunities for my kid, your kids and our grandkids. And you know, I did say that these reforms affect schools. Absolutely. But what they're telling us is these reforms are helping them save dollars so they can put more money into the classroom. <clears throat> That's what this is about. It's about kids' opportunities. And so, um, you know, I, I'm going to continue to work to keep our fiscal house in order and to create job opportunities so that when we graduate kids, they stay in our state and they don't go to another state because there's a better job. I thank you for being here today, and I ask for your vote on August 9th. Thank you. Now you can applaud. Thank you. Very nice job. Again, thank you to our guests this morning. It was great to have you here. We do appreciate your attendance this morning. Uh, thank you uh, to our sponsor again. We appreciate that, Verizon Wireless World. Thank you to the university for hosting us for the great breakfast. We appreciate all the work they did to, to host this this morning. On behalf of the River Falls Area Chamber of Commerce and Tourism Bureau, have a great day. Thanks for coming. Oh, by the way, I, didn't, I did not attack your career because I have a deep respect for teachers. I do. So I did not attack your teaching career. Okay? I think that's just, to straight, that's just to straighten it out. That's how I took it. I think that's how we did. Well, you should not. I it's appreciate not your apology. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Thank you. you again. Thank you, Nick. Great job. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much yes. for organizing you want this. The this mic? is great. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Good point. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> Magnificent.